I'm sorry, but I'm loving the blue lipstick and the eyeshadow and my eyeliner is actually okay today. Way to go, Sydney. Am I Evangeline Samos yet? I was trying to go for a silver look because first of all, I'm blonde like Evangeline, even though her hair is silver. And then I was like, I'm too pale to be a red or to cosplay as mare. So I did an Evangeline look. Does it fit? Probably not, but I have an excuse to wear gray eyeshadow and blue lipstick. So we're gonna roll with it. My name is Sydney and despite all my makeup, I'm super haggard inside because I stayed up all night and literally, I mean all night, to finish the one, the only, Warstorm by Victoria Aveyard. If you watched my July Better Bust video, you will know that this was one of my goals to finish, spoiler free, and guess what y'all, I heckin' did it. Finished this bad boy all by myself, no one told me how it ended, so... Yeah. I don't know how to give a spoiler-free version of this because this is the finale book, so if you haven't read the series, then you should go pick it up. So that's all I'm really gonna say, also because my battery really loves to mess with me, so we're just gonna pretend like I'm on borrowed time and start this review. So if you haven't read this series, you really should go pick it up. It's wonderful. I know it's been overhyped and a lot of people don't like it, but if you're true to your YA tropes and you enjoy, you know, a good book, this is a good series, especially if you're like a new reader and you're trying to start off. I'll stop talking. You should just really go pick up the book. Awesome. Thanks. Oh my gosh. I took all my notes for this on my phone. Also, I got a new case and some pineapples. If you wonder why my intro has pineapples, this is why. <laughs> so there's a fun fact. But as the book went on, my notes started having a lot more capital letters and exclamation points and question marks and crying emojis. So, oh, I took a lot of notes. I had to like scroll like five times. First of all, the book opens up just hours, hours after King's Cage when Cal and Mare had their little breakup. I'm kind of glad that that happened because I love Cal. He was great. First book, you know, we were like, oh my gosh, this is the ultimate OTP. They're gonna get together in the end. I liked how she like broke them up. That was nice. That was a nice touch. But the book starts hours after their breakup and she likes to physically remind us Hey, yeah, my heart is broken. This boy totally wants a crown over me. Honey, I'm sorry, but you're stronger than him. You could do way better, at least right now. But at the same time, did you really have to be that petty and call Cal Tiberius again? Like every time that she was like, Cal, no, no. It's Tiberius. You need to get that around your head. Why? Why oh, Why not call him Cal? That's how we know him. We know him as Cal. We get that his real name is Tiberius, but you don't gotta be like that. Even Cal was like, can you please not call me that? Like, you gotta stop calling me that. It just seemed really immature. Haha, <laughs> I totally forgot who Iris was at the very beginning. When we got her point of view, I was like, who is this chick? I don't remember her. And then I was like, oh, it's Maven's wife, the queen of the Lakelands. Well, the princess of the Lakelands, excuse me. Now the queen of Norta. It was really nice to see that Maven had like a competitor. He had an opponent in front of him. But yeah, I totally forgot who she was at first. Okay, now I'm gonna tell you that not a lot happened in the beginning. This was a slow, slow book in the beginning. The thing about finale books is that you really gotta do it. Like you really gotta make it good because usually the second books in the series are fantastic and that makes you wanna keep doing the series. Glass Sword was the slowest book I've ever read in my life. No offense to her. It was so slow. It was very hard. That's why it took so long for me to get it under my belt. I loved watching Maven's thought process when he like knew that Iris was afraid of him. It was really nice. Full disclosure, I love Maven Kalor. He is my favorite character. He is bomb. Love him. But I'll get into him in a little bit. The first real part where things were happening was when, um, what's it called? The company was attacked on the cliffs. I don't really remember much about it because I was like speed reading. I was like, I know this is action, but it's like filler action. So where's the good stuff? I liked seeing that Mare had PTSD because there was silent stone in the cliffs. She like broke down and screamed. <laughs> and then Farley had to show him up and be like, uh, guys, I can't get up. And her leg and her kneecap was like in a totally other direction. <laughs> All right, let's skip to page 230 ish where Maven and Iris are in the cells in whatever place we're in right now and Rash one of the triplets I think he's a triplet him Iberum and the other one if there is another one or maybe they're twins they can speak through each other's minds or something and so Rash is in the cell but he's speaking Mare's words and Maven's like Mare yeah! 
was so excited because I love Mare and Maven's conversations. That was a beast moment. Even though Mare had to give it to Ibarum, who then had to give it to Rash, and then Rash had to give it to Maven. Ibarum just deserves like the Oscar for actor of the year because he would like pace the way Maven would and he would sneer. I really liked that scene. And then she's like, huh, yeah, by the way, free the prisoners or we're gonna blow up your base. I mean, that was cool too, but I just liked the conversation. Oh, it's thundering outside. And oh my God. It's Mare. So if my house gets struck by lightning, I'm gonna blame Mare Barrow because I'm talking about War Storm and there is a storm outside my room. Okay, so Annabelle, first of all, Cal calls her Manabelle, cringe. But I loved it when she and Julian snuck into Iris's transporter car. I had totally forgotten that Julian was a singer. I don't know what the difference between singers and whispers are. It feels like they're the same freaking thing. I totally forgot that he had the ability to like control people with his voice. He's like a siren, which is dope. But there was the trade with Iris. We didn't know what her terms were, but we knew that Iris would get Salen Irel and Volo Samos in return for whatever she would put up with. And we didn't know what it was at first. At least I didn't because maybe I was clueless. But the terms were that she would have to give up Maven. Oh God, we're skipping back and forth. Before the company is attacked in the cliffs of Montfort. Yes, because Carmadon and Davidson, they were having a nice little dinner party. Cal just had to sit next to Mare and stir up drama, didn't he? Like, was that necessary? I thought the sitting next to her was a little petty, but you know, I was here for it. It was okay. I, I didn't mind it too much. The fight between Evangeline and Mare in the training area. Ptolemus, Cal, and Kylorn were in the room. They come in because they want to blow off some steam. Evangeline is trying to pit Mare and Cal together so that she can live her own life of the lane. Smart cookie, but also it's like matchmaker. I didn't know how to react to it at first. I kind of thought it was a little funny. I thought it was like too obvious of a move for her. I feel like Evangeline was a little bit smarter than that. The best part of that well, was like, that was just a warm up. Are you ready? And Mare's like, oh yes. And then it breaks. One of them has like ribs broken, broken nose, um, bleeding out, internal bleeding. I mean, they just beat the crap out of each other. And Kylorn goes, girls are weird. And Ptolemus, and Cal just agree. Brief pause, what the heck does smarts mean? There was like, my skin smarts, or that statement smarts. Does it mean like heated? Did it mean spark? I don't know what that means. I've been waiting for Kylorn to find freaking love because Mare totally ripped him off. As soon as I met Cal, I was like, of course this is gonna be the main ship, but you know what? Let's try and get the best friends together. Let's make Mare and Kylorn end game. Didn't work out. So I'm actually kind of happy that him and Cameron might have a thing going on. Let me tell you, there was not a lot of emotion for me in this book. I did not sob in this book. I did cry a little bit. My eyes burned with tears. It happens. But the first part of the book where I almost lost my cool and shed a tear was when someone flipped the gravity on them in Newtown in that little Newtown fight while the Harbor Bay thing was going on on the other side and Kylorn just fell down all these stairs was bleeding inside ribs were all the way broken I thought Kylorn was gonna die and I was a mess I was stressing my blood was pumping oh and Cameron started to cry because Cameron and Mare were like holding him up and like running him somewhere until the healers could get to him and she was like Mare, like she was crying and full on all caps, Mare was like, stop it. Like, don't even make it a thought that he's gonna die here. And it, oh, it, <laughs> it got me. Seeing Evangeline realize how her father didn't love her and was using her for his gain was really, really sad. She's like, he's my father. And even the way he treats me, I still love him. And I get that because it's a family bond. But regardless, she and Ptolemus were out fighting at Harbor Bay and for a split second she thought her brother was dead and seeing her break and stress and panic was needed. I loved that. Honestly, at the whole Harbor Bay thing, I was ready for Maven to show up because Cal was there and I was ready for it to be a brother on brother duel. You get where I'm going with this? Because he was like, this is Maven I'm talking about. He's like, Iris, have you ever been to Harbor Bay? And I knew that she was gonna be like bait, but I didn't know that she was gonna be smack in the middle of all the action, causing all this hell to unleash. I was here for it. Iris is B. Okay, Cal versus Iris. Dang. I remember in Glass Sword when Cal and Mare were crossing a stream or a river. He looked like he was going to be sick. And then he's 
in the middle of Harbor Bay fighting a water nymph. What the crap happened? Like, it's amazing where he's come. He's just moved miles. Water was like his biggest fear and it's the worst way that he could die because he's a burner. And then that happened and he almost did drown and die. That was a good scene. So Cal almost dies and Mayor takes the initiative to use that and be like, okay, this is the last time. I'm gonna make out with you now and sleep in your chambers. I get it. I would do the same thing. She saw this man drown, choke on water, not a very sexy thing, but he lived. That's a sexy thing to live through death. So she probably was like, yeah, I think I'm gonna kiss him, but it's the last time I swear. No, 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 no. the last time. This is it. I mean, I'm done. It's okay. I'm, uh, this isn't gonna happen again. You really think that? You really think this is the last time? Even Cal was like, are you lying? She's like, I hope so. And then they just hook up again, but like she deserves a little treat because she's doing all this bull crap and bleeding and hurting herself and seeing her friends almost die. But I liked that the whole scene with them coming across the room to kiss each other was like a metaphor. They're so different and they're so stubborn and they're not willing to budge and quit their cause. And so they slowly come together because the only thing that really bridges them together is their love for each other. <gasps> we got Maven's point of view. We got Maven's point of view. Hallelujah. I've been waiting for this moment. If he had point of views in the other books, I don't remember them. It's been a long freaking time since I read those other books. Holy smokes. I love reading in his point of view. His first heckin' sentence had me bawling laughing. I hate the waves. They offend me. What a legend this man is. It was very good to see his perspective because you see how dominating his mother's voice is in his head. Also, you realize towards the end how dominating Cal's mother's voice is in his own head or how dominant it is becoming. I think it's kind of a cool contrast that there's the evil voice in Maven's and then there's Cal, his mom's voice. She wants him to be noble, but she doesn't want him to be like the other kings. She wants him to be something different and bring peace. I don't know, I just really, really liked that. It does talk about how Maven's mother's voice, Alara's voice, is getting fainter. Like there could be hope. He just deserved so much better. Oh my gosh. But at the same time he misses his mom and it's like Evangeline because she always loves her dad despite the way that he treated her and it's the same. He misses his mom no matter how evil she was and no matter what kind of monster she made him into. And he knows that too. He knows that his mother made him this way. Maven talks about seeing his father dead and he says if I ever loved him, I have no memory of it. How freaking sad is that? This is why I hold on to Maven so tightly because I know that, yes, he's the villain and he's twisted and cruel and terrible at times, but this is not his own doing. If he were the normal boy that he was born as, he wouldn't be making these decisions. His mother is the true villain and his mother is what is stewing inside him. He's just Alara incarnate and it heats my blood when people are like, Maven needs to die. No, Maven needs help. Maven needs love. Maven needs someone to undo the twisted screws in his mind, but we can't. And he's just like this, but it's not him. It's his mom. She robbed him. She robbed him so bad. And it makes me so freaking angry. He still feels the ghost of his brother's love. He doesn't feel his brother's love, but he thinks that he feels the ghost of it. If he could only spit that out to someone, do you think they would have saved him? Do you think that he'd still be alive? Let me know in the comments below. And then he's talking about his mom again. And he goes, her words never exist beyond the cage of my head. King's cage. No, Mare was trapped in Maven's prison, but maybe just maybe. It's talking about Maven's headspace because he's trapped too. He's trapped in his mother's prison. Tell me if I'm wrong. Maven sat with his mom and watched the security tapes of Cal and Mare dancing together during the dance lessons in book one. Like he just watched and his whole heart broke, but he couldn't do anything. He just blinked, watched. And his mom was like, they were never good for you anyways. You see what they do? They ruin things. <laughs> It then flashes back to Mare in Cal's chambers at night. She's like sitting in the window or something and then eventually she goes to sleep. But before that, she's like, this is the last time. Yeah, first of all, last time, my butt. Second of all, Cal hides this book. We don't know what it is at first, but he hides this book in a drawer. It's like Mare doesn't see it, but she does. And just before she goes to sleep, Mare's like, hey, what was that book? What is that book? And then she goes to sleep. But only once she's asleep, Cal decides to say, it's my mother's diary. Oh my God. 
god! But I have to thank that diary for doing a dang good job of finally breaking the biggest stubborn head I've ever met in my entire life in a book. <gasps> We're gonna go meet Maven! Hip hip hooray! They decide to negotiate some terms and they decide to meet at Province Island in a chamber of Silent Stone. They don't decide on the Silent Stone, but it's there. But really they're not. Mare and Cal already know. Maven isn't gonna bargain. Mare puts on this deep blue gown almost to compliment Iris, but she flaunts the M brand that's on her collar or her chest or wherever it is. I think it's like right here where my really annoying necklace is. In the room, Maven gets the heck roasted out of him and gets so peeved by everything going on. Bless his little heart. Because Julian goes on this like fully rehearsed speech of how the stones of history will turn over and the times will change and the oppressor will fall into the hands of the oppressed and all this mumbo jumbo that actually sounded quite eloquent, if I may say. And Maven goes, did you rehearse that, Julian? That's what you do in your library all alone all those times. And Mare, queen, goes, I doubt anyone spends more time alone than you do. Burn. The history backtracking at the end of chapter 24, where she's trying to see what set all of this into motion. She's like, was it when I fell in Queen's trial? Was it when Cal took my wrist when I was just a red thief? Was it when Kylorn's master died? You know, that sort of thing. And it was just kind of nice. It gave us like a look back at how far we've come in the series, but it also you know, makes you question, you know, what did happen? Like, what set it in motion? And we freaking find out! Stinkin' John! <laughs> also, quick pause. I love it when Farley goes, you report to Kylorn. It's what I've been waiting for all along. I also love any time it mentions the first book. If it mentions stuff from the second or third book, it's very hard for me to pick up on because I was more invested in the first book than the others because there was a moment where Annabelle tells Maven to kneel before Cal and he goes, no. I don't think so. And that's the exact words he used when Mare was tied in the first book and it was the first debut of his betrayal. She's like, Maven, help me up. And he goes, no, I don't think so. When Cal tells Maven the last thing that is said in that room, when Cal says, until we meet again, and Maven just snaps. I did like that reference because that was how he ended his letters with Mare. I thought that was so good, oh my gosh. The trade comes into play because they're on this bridge and I imagine this bridge to be over like the biggest chasm of water ever. Like it was just suspended in midair or something. They had Maven pinned down on one side and then they had Salen Irol on the other side under Julian's hold. They gave the Irol dude over to the Lakeland Queens and I thought they were like witches because they were like drowning the dude, killed him and Dang. And I was really ready for Evangeline's dad to show up and be killed as well. But he didn't show up. But Evangeline picks up on it. She's like, no one would just trade the murderer for Maven. Like, no, that wouldn't happen. He murdered Iris's dad to impress Evangeline's dad and win the favor. So she knew that her dad was going to be turned over. Rip. Maven says he wants to be buried with his mom and I think that just about almost killed me. I didn't cry, but I thought that was super emotional because, you know, after how terrible she was, she's, he still wanted to be buried with her because he was a part of her and she is practically his whole entity now. Screw her. And then, oh and then, we have Maven and everything seems fine and dandy. And then Mare turns the tides with Davidson and Farley and Kylorn, and she goes to Cal and she says, step down or we step back. The feminine power of that scene, even though guys were helping in this, but the girls were like, you in, you out, bish. I was here for it, I was so excited, and I knew, I knew that he couldn't do it because Cal was so freaking stubborn. What did you expect? What did you expect? I didn't expect anything otherwise. And she said her goodbye and they were about to leave and Mare goes, I'll be right back. And I really, for a minute, I was like, oh, she's gonna go see Cal again. She's gonna kiss him one last time. She's going to see Maven. That final conversation, or at least what I thought was gonna be the final conversation between her and Maven, she tells him that they hunted for someone to try and fix his head and fix all that his mother did to him. And for a twinge of a second, I thought that Maven was going to react positively. His instincts, Thought when he heard that statement, when he knew that they tried to help him. They tried, tried. And then he's like, well, you just gave me a better goodbye than I deserved. And Mare goes, well, what do I deserve, Maven? Maven, 
bless his soul, love him, goes better than we ever gave you. They teleport him and Mare. Like, where did they go? Why did they take him? And then I realized that was what they were intending to do the whole freaking time. For At first, I thought the new blood was turning on her. It was all according to plan. <laughs> and I was getting excited. I was like, Maven's gonna live a little longer. La, 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 la. My notes, exactly, read. Evangeline came out to her parents. Whoop, whoop. They didn't like it so much. <laughs> <sighs> because it was at dinner with her and Tully and Elaine and her parents and her mother. Why did I think her mother was dead? I don't know, that was just what I thought. I totally forgot about her. Because Elaine had previously said, I don't know how much longer I can live like this. Now she is deciding she's gonna fix that and she's gonna go live her future. She's like, Elaine doesn't belong to you or to Tolly. And they're like, oh, does she belong to you? She's like, we belong to each other. Did I just break my necklace? I sure heckin' did, oh my god. The whole jewel fell out right here. <laughs> My necklace was not here for me to have like a full-on discussion and get a little too passionate. But I'm so glad she stood up to her parents. It's a very modern premise of like times right now, but it fit in the fantasy world too and I really liked that. <laughs> Side note, I need to go see Love, Simon or at least rent it or something. So there was Mare and Maven's private conversation and then they left. And then there was Cal and Evangeline's private conversation. They say they are both afraid. And Evangeline goes, I miss her. And she's talking about Elaine. And Cal goes, so do I. Like, why the f do you have to be like that, Cal? Multiple times you could have spared yourself from this pain, but no. You had to put on your pretty little prince crown and turn into a king of a fallen kingdom. All because your daddy was that, like... And then <laughs> Evangeline decides that she's going to let her dad die. She's not going to stop him if they're going to get traded because she tells Cal that she thinks her dad is going to be a part of the trade because she doesn't think the trade is over and she's right. My poor heart of that whole scene. <laughs> we finally get to see that future seeing little weasel. He's not little. He's actually like a grown man, like gray hair, red eyes. On top of a mountain when Mare decides to climb up and she's a little hazy. <laughs> Turns out that when we read that Kylorn's master fell and that's how he died, he was pushed by John. Oh my god, I wanted to rip this man in two. So that we realize is the catalyst for all of this. Oh, and then Cal is having a small breakthrough. Bless his heart, because he's reading his mom's diary, or as much of it as Julian could transcribe before Alara destroyed all of her original diary and he reads that his mom doesn't want him to be like the other kings. She wants him to bring peace and not die fighting. He will not. He will not. And I was like, stop being stubborn and change please. Okay, so then Maven agrees to lead the Scarlet Guard through the tunnels, like the original escape tunnels that were in book one. And then when they leave and he's agreed to the deal, then they leave and they agree to the deal and he's sitting in his cell thinking of an escape. I am here for it. I am one of the few supporters that does not want Maven to die. This whole ride, from the beginning, from his betrayal, from everything else, I did not want him to die. This whole time I've been supporting him living and surviving and not dying. Then we realized why is it every time I talk about Maven, the thunder claps? I guess I am talking about the villain here. We find out that when it comes to the decision of is it my life or Mare's life, if only one of us gets to live, every single time from the beginning, he has always chosen his own life to be saved. And we learn that he's gonna kill Mare. So I'm sitting here thinking, oh my gosh, everyone is team Mare. Nobody likes Maven. Everybody wants Maven dead. And now I'm conflicted because they're gonna kill the main character. And every time a main, main, main character dies, the book is trash. And I was like, I don't want this book to be trash, but I don't want Maven to die. And I was very stressed and I was like, I don't know how I'm gonna get through this. Like what's gonna happen here? Because he's talking about how Mare was never enough for Cal to change his mind. And it's the same with Maven. Mare is not enough to change his mind. He's still gonna be the way he is. And I was like, oh crap. Maven asks Mare if Cal broke her heart and she, <laughs> And she tells him, so did you. Oof, that was an oof. I just saw a lot of light outside. Hi, Mare, welcome to the scene. Welcome to book talk. Because he's like, Cal did it for the crown and Maven did it for his mother, Alara, because she was scheming the whole time. That's why she made him watch all the things when they were dancing and twisting him into this monster and 
The gray ends of Mare's hair is now purple because all her fellow Electricons have really weird hair. There's a green-haired guy and a blue-haired girl and now she's the purple tips. And Maven's last card to play is to say, I love the hair. That hit me. When Evangeline confronts her parents again, she's pinned down and she's nearly killed and her dad's like gonna murder her. Ptolemus comes in, thank God, comes to her aid. All's well, sort of. Then freaking Julian shows up. After they're running out, then Julian sings to Evangeline's mom, run away, forget your children. And she runs, which means all that's left is Volo, which means the trade is gonna be complete. And I figured he was just gonna sing Volo over to Iris and then they would just chill out and walk away. He sings this man off the edge and into like spears or something down below at the bottom, kills him. And Cal says like he doesn't think that Julian has ever killed someone and that was just like, whoa. And then Tolly and Evangeline escape in the train that Maven was planning to escape in, but they escape and prepare to go to Montfort where Elaine is waiting and their new life's in store. She deserved it. She deserved it. She deserved it all. She deserved the world. Okay, my exact notes say, this is when Maven and the Scarlet Guard are in the tunnels. Maven looks like he's going to burn up the tunnels, but escapes in an explosion. I had the right instincts. I hate this thunder. Cause he looked angry. Cause he was like, just kill me, just kill me, do it. And he had icy rage in his face. And then an explosion goes off. It was Maven. I said he looked like he was going to burn up, but I didn't think his abilities were intact cause he didn't have his bracelet. He still did it. He was that mad. He was that mad. And then there was the moment after they escaped, they were like, you know, what the heck? He's just gonna run. We'll figure that out. They still gotta ward off this attack. So the radio sounds off, all the lightning shoots in the air and Cal realizes that they are here, even though they left him. He gets on the radio, he's like, Mare, where are you? And she's like, I'm here. And he goes, is it too late? The lights flash in the air again. She goes, no, no it isn't. So Iris and Sinra just leave because they realize that the Reds have boats under them. There's no way that just their lake lands can get to them now because their army's rebuilding. And so they just heckin' retreat? Like, what? I thought the ending of that was very weird. Like, it was so sudden and abrupt and it was just so calm. I know it was like a ceasefire, which means it could return. There's no mention of it. I was kind of glad though, because you know, we got both sides of the argument going on here in this book. And I'm glad that Iris didn't get killed off because I would have been like, that's very unnecessary because she did have a motive behind her actions. <laughs> I mean, they were just kind of like, oops, bye, we gotta go. Like, let's go home. Cause you know, and then Maven is in the bed chambers. Mare finds him. And there's the thunder right on heck and cue. And she locks him in this room and they're going to fight to the death. And at this point, I'm like, I don't know who to cheer for. And they keep fighting and they argue and he kind of slices her and they're fighting in silent stone. So he has a dagger. She doesn't have her abilities. She's just having to like be defensive. Maven chokes her like almost to near death. She's like bleeding to death. He looks at her and he's sad, but he's satisfied. And that is the last we hear from Maven. And it's just like, what the crap happens now? The other people found her bleeding to death and then they went to heal her but maven is dead or is he there's no body there's no proof they just say he's dead he's not showing up i think he's still alive so i'm not gonna get too crushed about that that's another reason why i didn't cry i wrote maven is dead no but is he He's probably not, he's probably out there because this, he could show up. But anyways, if he did, did he like kill himself? If Mare was choking to death and she was bleeding out, she couldn't shock him with her powers because they were in silent stone, couldn't she? He could have sliced her up and chopped her head off. He showed her mercy enough to choke her and let her bleed. So if he's dead, did he kill himself? That's what I'm wondering. We're getting to the final part of my notes. The epilogue comes around and once more, Mare and Cal do not get together at the end of the book. I said it, I said it. They want to, but they do the very mature thing. I'm so thankful Victoria put this into the end of the story. Mare does not get together with him because she knows that she needs time to heal and so does he. And he's like, you don't tell me what I want and what I need. Bish, she just did. She said it herself. I'm 18, I have time. Yes, girl, yes. You have time. Good for you. The story is starting to wrap up. We have like two pages left and we see Mare and Gisa sitting and watching the bison. She's talking about how all the people killed off all these bison, but now they're all back. At first I thought this was like an animal cruelty prevention thing that she's trying to slip in, like advocate for the animals. But she's like, all these animals came from the slaughter and so will I. So will this nation, this world, our people. Everyone's just gonna rise up from the slaughter and they're gonna rebuild and it's gonna be okay. And to seal 
the whole book series off. She's touching her earrings, one for Brie, one for Trammy, one for Shade, and one for Kylorn. And I'm just like, is the last one in there? Is it in there? And she's like, the last one, the blood red stone for Cal. And she's like, maybe I'll go back. Maybe, I don't know. I don't know if I'll go back. And finally she decides someday, someday she's gonna go back and she's gonna see him, see what has happened. She doesn't expect him to wait for her, but she will go back and give it a try. And she does remember him and all that happened between them. The whole arc of the story is represented in the blood red stone that she has. And in a way it's like our stone, it's like everyone and she touches it. That is all I have to say everyone. Thank you so, so much for watching. I am so sorry about the audio and the thunderstorms and the lightning and the growling and the pacing and the broken necklace. I just like to have a good time, you know? If you like this video, give it a thumbs up and subscribe because I will be doing more book reviews once I read more books. Thank you, Victoria Aviard, for this whole series. I loved it. It was fantastic. Once more, my name is Sydney. Thank you so much for watching. I post new videos every Thursday, and until next time, bye!